Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world, and welcome once again to another FIP webinar. I think uh, one of the first ones that we've done this year. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Now, building a direct-to-consumer digital business is or should be the core strategy for media businesses today. It's never been more important to move from an indirect relationship with your customer to a direct one, building a detailed understanding of who they are and how they interact with you. Linked to this, of course, the imminent demise of third-party cookies, which creates challenges for the data strategy that is a fundamental enabler of a D2C approach. So today we're going to be exploring all of these issues and more, hoping to identify the hallmarks of a successful paywall strategy in the approaching third-party cookie-free world. And I'm delighted to say that I'll be joined by three experts who are going to help us navigate this complex topic. But before I introduce them, let me first of all thank our sponsor for today's webinar, Zephyr. One of FIP's key strategic partners, Zephyr is the dynamic subscription experience platform built for the effective optimization and personalization of the user experience in order to drive conversion. They empower commercial and technical teams to create personalized experiences for every customer that deliver powerful subscription relationships for life, powering leading publishing brands such as New Scientist. So if you want to find out more, please do go and visit zephyr.com uh, and learn a bit more about the business. Also, before I introduce my guests, some housekeeping items. These sessions are designed to be interactive and they work best when you, our audience, asks questions. So please do use the Q&A button, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A throughout the session and asking questions as we go along. This session is being recorded, so if you want to watch it again, it will be on our YouTube channel to find us, search for Fit World. And finally, a reminder to sign up for our newsletter. It's absolutely the best way to keep abreast of the latest industry news and views, as well as learning more about our activities, including, of course, the return live and in person of our flagship event, the Fit Congress, which takes place in June. Right, well, I think that's enough for me. I think it's now time to introduce my guests for today. Joining me are Anna Lobb, VP of Publishing at MPP Global, Mark Whistler, Head of Product Marketing and Enablement, enablement rather at Zephyr, and Alan Hunter, formerly of News Corp and now co-founder of consultancy firm HBM Advisory. Anna, Mark and Alan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, James. Fantastic to have you all here. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on this session today. I wanted to start by looking at the rationale behind a paywall and just tell our audience why is developing a paid content strategy important? Alan, do you want to take that one? Sure, certainly. So I think we should, um, we all know the structural reasons behind this, but we should kind of just uh, reassert them quickly. Um, obviously, the reason that uh, kind of advertisers paid us uh, in the old world was because we had an audience who bought our magazines and newspapers uh, and we were able to deliver them that audience. Of course, now uh, Google and Facebook can deliver that audience and any other audience you want to find a lot more quickly and uh, kind of often, uh, as, we, as we know to our cost, a lot more cheaply. So kind of in the long term, really, the, the ad business is, is a very difficult place for publishers to play in unless we think we can get better data uh, and targeting than Facebook and Google, um, which as we all know is going to be difficult. So the reader revenue model uh, looks much more attractive. And I think there are a number of reasons for this. One is because you, you own the relationship uh, with your readers. If you're doing um, subscriptions, you are going to have uh, recurring revenue. Uh, and also, once you, your kind of once your investment is done, you're able to add subscribers to your model um, with very little marginal cost. So, of course, there's the cost of acquisition, but but essentially, you are, you know, they're not pure profit, but they're not far off pure profit. So it's a very kind of profitable area to be in. And I, I think also it helps you bring you closer to your customers um, because you're having to respond uh, directly to what they want. You're not you're not just going for a kind of uh, a low value click which may get you the ad dollars, you, you're actually having to encourage people to pay for your content, which I think is, is very important and actually really, really good for, um, for publishers themselves. And uh, getting people to pay for content, that's gotta be a good thing, right? I mean, is that a key driver for this? Um, of course, and, um, and I think what's probably interesting, James, we, we, we all talk about 
paywalls as a means by which to ask people to pay. Um, but interestingly, because of the change with, with cookies, the first step before we ask people to pay for content really is, is to ask them to share their data. And you know, one of the, the, the strongest and most valuable steps in that process is collecting first party data. And quite often it, it's the paywall that, that kicks in and, and, and does that. Um, so I, you know, I think when we talk about paywall technology and technologies like Zephyr, we, we do have to reset our thinking a little bit about what paywall means and, and how we use those tools and why. Um, so ultimately, yes, the, the, the aim is to backfill pots of revenue. Um, but before we even get that far, we, you know, as publishers, really have to understand our customers, collect that first party data and identify what our value proposition is. Um, and that, that's all underpinned by data. So I, I think whether or not you're going to eventually pay on whatever that model looks like, um, the, the paywall tool can be massively useful. Um, in the future when we're, we're, we're focusing on tech um, and strategy. Mark, you obviously coming from the, the tech side, from Zephyr, big enabler of this kind of, uh, this kind of business model. What is it that your clients tell you about the rationale behind this? Uh, yeah, it's really interesting just picking up on one of the things that Anna said. It really starts to, by putting in um, paywalls and, and data walls, as said, not just for um, backfilling of revenue, but it really starts to shift the power back into the um, journalistic and the publisher's hands around the types of content that they're developing and the types of value that they're delivering to their customers. No longer are you kind of ham or hamstrung by having to create content that is more likely to generate revenue, but uh, generate ad revenue, but actually you can really start to focus and hone in and understand what your readership really sees as valuable um, in what you're creating and then drive more of that sort of content and kind of really shift your kind of value proposition towards that to ultimately deliver that better value and that's really what our publishers are starting to do they're starting to see okay well actually what's my kind of revenue mix where are we seeing revenue start to decline and, and incline and actually how can we diversify that revenue mix by not only bringing in a kind of data strategy but then also building on top of that with um uh diversified revenue through uh paywalls and then subscription revenue as well so i mean you mentioned diversification of revenue there and newspapers have been very good at this in in, in this space for a long time now magazine companies have lagged behind a bit why do you think that is anna why why is there really an opportunity for magazine media in paid content um i think there absolutely is james um i think it would be naive if we just pinned all our hopes purely on the paywall alone uh, the key is, uh, uh, <laughs> as with many things in this world, diversity. You know, you need a mix of revenue streams. The paywall isn't going to save us all. Um, I think the challenge, though, for magazine publishers for a long time has been that they've traditionally used bureaus and, and outsourced customer management. So much harder for them to understand how users are interacting, engaging with their content online. Um, and, and therefore also much harder for them to be able to just kind of plug and play with technologies like Zephyr um, or, you know, some of, the, some of the other technologies we see in the market um, if you don't own any customers. Um, so I think they've been held back by technology. I, I think the other part, when we look honestly about the, the magazine sector, is that it's very much been advertorial content. So difficult to put a paywall on, on advertorial content. However, um, there are lots of opportunities for development and growth. You know, if we look at, you know, video, audio, the different formats that digital permits and more interactive products, um, you can absolutely apply a paywall to those products. But I think we need to focus more on what the value proposition is rather than just gating content. Alan, you obviously work with a wide range of clients in your, in your business, in your, in your advisory business. Are you seeing magazine companies starting to come to you talking about paid content strategies? Uh, Simply, yes. Um, and, and I think uh, there's a lot of truth in what Anna says um, about having been held back by tech because, you know, the newspaper paper company is typically bigger um, and operating at a bigger scale. So the, the kind of the case for investing in the technology required to do subscriptions or paid content more generally was certainly there. Um, having said that, I think um, that magazines typically, especially if they're specialist magazines, have a a huge opportunity to do paid content uh, and you know we see a lot of clients talking to us about this and we're you know 
one of the things we're saying is that people people pay for things online that they can't get anywhere else. And specialist magazines are ideally placed to provide this content, actually in a way that um, generalist newspapers are perhaps less able to do. Um, and so if you, if you, you know, I think obviously newspapers or former newspapers will survive and some will thrive, but I think there's a kind of bigger growth opportunities actually in the specialist sector um, because you're providing things that feed people's passions, you know, that they find essential for their work uh, or, or whatever, but it's very much in the, in that kind of, that go, it's like, it's an inch, inch wide and a mile deep rather than a mile wide and an inch deep. And I, I think that's really something that people pay for. And if you look at the, the, uh, the kind of digital only propositions that have sprung up in the past few years, uh, well, past kind of decade or so, you know, Politico, The Athletic, The Information, uh, looking at respectively politics, uh, American and British sports and Silicon Valley, they are all very specialist. Uh, and they're attracting huge uh, valuations. So I think there's a lot of inspiration there for magazine publishers. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a, there's a great opportunity for them. And Mark, you, you at Zephyr, you're already working with a range of magazine partners. Uh, we mentioned in the introduction, New Scientist, there are others as well. Has it, uh, presumably, it's been an overwhelmingly positive experience for them so far. Yeah, it has. Um, one of the biggest things that we've been seeing as well is um, to build on it is kind of where the power lays um, and taking back that control. Um, ultimately, the magazine publishers and the publishers themselves can dictate how the data flows to them um, um, from those bureaus or, or where that information ends up. Um, and similarly, how they're kind of moving into the more digital space. If you're reliant on a physical product and a, and a classic website you have very little you have two very different products if you're um and just shifting the information from a, a kind of physical magazine onto a onto a website while easy you kind of lose some of that kind of classic experience especially in the specialist publications so actually it's kind of we're starting to see people starting to look at options of building native apps building kind of very digital only um uh, publications where they can, can uh, they can own that experience they own the distribution because it is uh through digital and, and, and through the app so yeah there, there's so many options out there to them and we're really kind of pushing not to be hamstrung by some of those kind of like classic legacy um kind of print uh methodologies and kind of really embracing this new world sorry sorry i think it is worth saying though that um you know in the real world for a lot of publishers particularly you know that in across europe 80 percent of their revenue it, it, subscription revenue does still come from print so whilst the publishers really need these kind of super flexible tools that enable them to work with digital they need a combined strategy you know you can't have either or and i think that's been again part of the challenge from the technology perspective you're either using a print legacy system or a digital system or you're trying to plug those two things together um, and actually, you know, if we talk about what a business model for a magazine might look like in the future for a moment, you probably still want to ship a magazine because people still really like to hold a magazine. I do. I love physical products, books. Maybe they want to do um, a subscription box. You know, if it's a hobby, something like that, they could ship a physical product as well. Maybe they could roll in an app that works with your physical products. You know, they, they, the point is they need solutions that manage all of that and that can bundle those products together. And it, you know, it's not gonna be one thing, like I say, back to the paywall, it's not gonna be just that one thing. That's an access point to push people around the website and to encourage them to buy products that are relevant to them, but it should be a mix. And all publishers should be thinking about that plus advertising as well, how to get that mix right. Um, so I think that's key looking forward. Definitely. Bundling as well as um, digital. Definitely just to pick up on that as well, from a technology perspective, one of the things that we're seeing an increased amount of, especially as we move into um, more of the magazine publishers coming on board is from an integration partner perspective, some of these fulfillment, uh, some of these fulfillment houses are who are actually trying to solve these problems themselves and build systems themselves to uh, manage both physical distribution as well as digital. And we're getting increased requests to kind of build integrations with a lot of these kind of traditionally legacy um, fulfillment houses who are they themselves are taking a step towards being a much more kind of diverse provider for their customers. And, and uh, publishers who are out there, a piece of reassurance. If you think, oh, my God, I make all my money still from print and everybody else is digitally transformed. Trust me, 
you're not alone. 90% of the publishers out there still make all their money from print, um, which is kind of why we're having this session today. Alan, Alan mentioned digital. And one of the things I hear very often from publishers is, well, if I have a paid content strategy, a paywall strategy, it's going to destroy my digital advertising revenue. Is that true? Uh, no, it needn't be. It depends how you look at it. Obviously, your, uh, your advertising director may well talk in such apocalyptic terms. But I think one thing it's really important to recognize if you're thinking about a paid content strategy is essentially that 95% of your users uh, will never subscribe, which sounds really kind of bleak, but actually the revenue you get from the super fans among the 5% will more than make up for that. So I guess the question is, how do you deal with the, the, the 95%? And obviously having an element of free content uh, which also acts as a, a kind of sampling mechanism for your subscription offer, uh, means that you can run an advertising business and a subscription business at the same time. I think the the, you know, the, the best example of this is, is the New York Times, um, which actually, funny enough, only relatively recently, despite having had a paywall for a decade, uh, moved into being majority digital subscription revenue compared with print. So, yeah. but... They they are very much avowedly subscription first. They they say this very publicly. Their target is uh, I think it's 15 million subscription subscribers now. Um, having said that, they also have what I think is the world's biggest advertising business uh, among any newspaper. So while you can kind of be focused on subscriptions, that doesn't mean you have to lose your advertising business. Um, it's a matter of being careful, and, and you be have to to totally erase one uh, just on the point of principle. Anna, you mentioned this earlier, it's about balance. It's about diverse revenues, not just a focus on yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. It'd be naive, wouldn't it, to think that, you know, and I, 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 probably, I remember sort of 10 years or so ago when we all first started talking about, well, certainly in the UK, first started talking about paywalls, like it was, it was gonna be the, the savior of the industry. And I think we've all kind of balanced our expectations a little bit now. And we understand that it's a really important part of the mix. Um, but but you're absolutely right, everything in balance. I think um, Alan's example of the New York Times is brilliant because they they are so diverse. I mean, they actually, I think it's, uh, there's a stat, it's like one of the fifth most successful paid content products in the UK is the Crossword app. Nothing to do with news. If I launched a crossword app tomorrow, nobody would buy it. However, because they're the New York Times, because they have the eyeballs, because they understand that their audience really like crosswords, they can launch that, they can generate revenue from that, that becomes part of their mix, as does a new kids magazine that they launched in print that they deliver on a Saturday morning, you know, with the newspaper to keep the kids busy because actually, you know, parents want their children to not look at screens all the time, you know. So this, it's all about diversity. And I think um, I think there's, there's an interesting shift that's happening because of the issue with the cookies in the ad industry at the moment. And I like to think of it as a bit of a, bit of a gift, perhaps, that the subscriptions team could give to the advertising team that might finally unite those kind of different camps and silos to a, a, a kind of united aim um, certainly from a data perspective, um, because uh, as, as, as we all know, if consumers are happy to give us their data, first party data is much more accurate than anything that we can model. Um, and, and that is valuable for advertisers as well. So again, you know, back to the use of a paywall, maybe the first step is just to collect first party data and that feeds advertising revenue for you. Um, and then if you turn on paid, you know, six months later, you're there, you're set up, you're ready to go. So, yeah, so balancing all things, I think. So, Mark, I mean, having decided to start with a paid content with a paywall strategy, it, uh, it sounds to me what I'm hearing is that the first thing you've got to do is your data strategy. Is that right? Um, I think the first thing that you really have to do is understand what your revenue mix is today and understand where historically your revenue is becoming if you've been a 100% 
revenue, uh, sorry, ad revenue generated business, it's going to be very difficult for you or it's a high risk for you to throw up a hard paywall or even potentially a, a metered paywall if your users have no concept of even a registration on your site up until this point. So you really have to understand where um, your kind of your audience is kind of uh, receptibility is to something like um, uh, starting to build out a data strategy. And if you are starting from scratch, yes, building that data lake is really, really important and kind of going to be the first step that you're going to want to take. But how you approach that is really going to be the most important part. Like, is it first of all, a data wall strategy where you're asking people to register either for a newsletter or um, just to gain access to some of the content on, on your site. One of the things that a lot of our customers are, are using is that kind of metered data wall approach where actually after two or three articles, we're just asking you for your email to continue to access that content. And it allows you to start to kind of test the waters and open up the options for you to really start experimenting with how you progressively build out that strategy so that when you do come Come to start asking for for a paid kind of um exchange that your customers are primed and you have all of that data that you can uh draw from when starting to build out those strategies so you can start to build that personalization so that you're not gonna cause that knee-jerk reaction from a reader because in the world that we live in as well today, there is so much media out there and there's so much that uh, customers uh, and readers can access. I know personally, um, if I have heard something, I Google, I'll go to my, I'll go to my kind of safety zones of the publications that I know I want to read. But if I want a, a different view, if I land on a site and it's taking 15, 20 seconds to load, and then I get hit with a paywall, you've lost me forever. So it's really starting to, you need to understand that in this world, yes, data is king. And especially with the, as we we're saying, with the death of the third party, because we need to start building those first party data relationships. But it's how you, how you build that strategy piece by piece by piece is what's really going to kind of set the difference between publishers who really see success with it, maybe over a slightly longer time period, but actually kind of really set themselves up for success. And those who kind of are after kind of quick wins and um, or speedy victories, as I like to call them. <laughs> um, and Alan, just on this kind of first steps thing, is, is also a kind of rigorous assessment of the value of your content important as well? Are you able to, do you have to ask yourself the question, would I pay for this? I mean, is that a, is that a crucial step as well? Uh, ab absolutely, yes. I mean, I think, um, there has been a lot of kind of skepticism, if not hostility towards data in um, journalistic organizations, and particularly from the, the newsroom. And I, I say this as someone who comes from a newsroom, so I, I know of what I speak. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, it's a suspicion that it's kind of uh, uh, attacking our gut instinct and what works, you know, what our kind of feeling, our, in, our kind of uh, understanding of readers and what works. Now, I, I would say that, uh, you know, your, your data is your readers um, and you really need to understand, you know, through that data, what it is that they value and what, what you do. And you have to be prepared that it's, it's not, it's not what you think, um, you know, and, you know, just a, a story from my time at the Times, we, we discovered that we were producing a lot too much content and that actually people rather than reading kind of wanting kind of five or six stories on a, on a kind of particularly big issue, they'd only read one or two. And so we actually now really narrowed down our focus into kind of making sure we knew we were producing content that people really wanted to read. Um, you know, there's always the fear that you're kind of um, being, uh, you know, led by the data. But I think if you kind of acknowledge that you're being informed by the data, that's a, that's a better place to start. It's not making you do things. It's it's kind of helping you to provide your customers, the readers, with with what they want. So yeah, I think it, I think it's a really important thing to do to to kind of get that understanding and realize what it is you do for people. I mean, be before digital and the data that attends it, we had very little idea of what people really found valuable of what we did. I mean, we had focus groups and so on, but the data shows you in real time what people find valuable and what you can give them more of and make them more satisfied. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Anna, we build this session as looking at the kind of post cookies landscape. There may be plenty of people out there who are not familiar with what's happening. By the way, if, you're, if you aren't familiar with what's happening, you can go to fit.com and read our 
our report on data strategy in the post cookies world. But Anna, just give us a summary uh, from your point of view of what's happening uh, and what the impact might be. Sure. So, um, so I'm going to go. I'm going to go layman's terms here because that's often how I best understand technology. Um, but basically, the, the the shift is related to the fact that users are now much more aware um, of the fact that publishers are collecting and using their data. Um, and because of scandals like Cambridge Analytica and you know the programs like Social Network, that awareness means um, that there is much more drive now. Um, to have regulation around how customer data is used and anonymous data is used. The biggest change with the cookies really is that you, you're not going to be able to track people from third party websites. Obviously, you will be able to still use cookies on your own website. Um, there are a few different options. Um, there are technology companies that are looking at things like edge computing, for example, um, you know, particularly looking at getting around that in the ad space. I know Zephyr plug into a few of them, people like Permitive, for example, who are very good at basically ed edge computing basically just means that the data remains on the user's device. So nothing is stored or, or managed in the cloud. Um, but their ability to work with that data will allow them to take the kind of 10% of authenticated users and model back from that um, and look for, and you know, it's, it's quite a nice solution because it, it, it actually plays in favor of diversity, you know, rather than these kind of um, segments that we all imagine, you know, women will like this, men will like this, a certain age group I can target, it, it, it will actually begin to treat people as individuals. So, you know, it, it, the, the effectiveness of that approach is, is probably quite high. So option one, um, if you want to work with anonymous user data, is, is, is look at these tools um, with, with cookie-less and edge computing. Um, but, you know, the common sense option, I think we're a little bit away from that, really, in the subscription space and in, in a lot of cases. Uh, the common sense option does have to be to focus on the first party data strategy um, because obviously first party data is so valuable uh, by comparison. Um, so I don't know if that goes any way to explain, but that's my layman's terms um, explanation of... Um, no, so I understood it, which means it must be a good explanation. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, Alan, this sounds like a great opportunity for publishers, is it? Well, yes, I think... I think um rather than if you're like outsourcing their, their data, um, they have an opportunity now to kind of uh, get it in-house and really really think about what, what they're doing with it um, and uh, you know, making sure that they're kind of properly serving their, their customers in a way that's kind of relevant to each and every one of them, which I think in the long term can only be a good thing. I think it will take quite a while for people to fully get their heads around all the, the implications. Um, because you see lots of different suggestions knocking around, but um, yeah, I think I think ultimately it should it should be good for us. So, Mark, we've uh, we've decided to launch a paywall. We've got our data strategy in place. Just take a step back for us and just summarise the different types of paywall that you see in your work with your clients. Uh, yeah, of course. So, I think when we're looking at it, as we say, there's there's paywall looking focused at kind of traditionally on how you get to that monetary kind of transaction point and then you've got your data wall side of things which is actually how you start to build that first party data relationship and the two it's really important to think about the two together and how one kind of links into the other and how you build out those strategies but once you start to get to uh, a specific kind of financial transaction side of things on the paywall you have kind of more of the traditional kind of pay hard paywalls uh where you potentially show one article before you hit um, throw up kind of a, a lockdown on your content. Similarly, you may kind of see some of the faded out content where you give a, a snapshot of what the article is about and then ask uh, for that uh, transaction. You then have uh, what's kind of called soft paywalls or metered paywalls, where um, this allows for a much more kind of personalized um, approach towards um, your paywall strategy, where you can set individual limits or kind of meters either globally or based on the data that you've collected uh, for uh, individual customers. And that's one thing at Zephyr that we really try to, to enable our customers to do is kind of take that personalized approach um, towards their uh, paywall strategy. But that essentially, you say you kind of set, okay, Okay, five uh, views or five articles before and you'll see quite a few publications will have a counter across saying you've accessed one this month or one today of you've got five left etc and really that's kind of really focused towards 
your audience who, uh, especially if you have quite an, uh, a high unknown audience and who need to build up that understanding of what value you offer to them, that really allows you to kind of play with that. Um, it might be that if you have someone who only is coming to your site for your sports content, actually, if, you, if they have repeatedly visited you over a period of time, then actually they're much more likely to convert on a sports piece of content than they are um, on a, a political piece of content, for example. So uh, um, really kind of the kind of intelligent or a, a soft or metered paywalls is really where you start to see um, a lot more of the kind of uh, flexibility coming in. Um, and then you can start to uh, kind of, you then start to move into kind of the freemium area uh, of stuff where you have uh, public uh, publications and publishers who are adopting kind of two uh, two approaches where all of or the majority of their content on the site is still free, but a paywall gives you access to kind of specific additional feature functionality on a site uh, or um, ad free experiences as well. Um, so it's uh, uh, those are kind of the three kind of main ones that we're seeing our publishers put in place. And uh, so having done all this and, and decided on our type of payroll, we now need some customers. Anna, what are the most effective means that you've seen for acquiring customers for your payroll? Okay, um, so I think when you, when, you, when you launch a payroll, you don't just kind of pick your business model and then kind of sit back and cross your fingers and, and hope that people will come. Um, I think the sensible answer is, as with any product, you have to market your product. And marketing your product means finding right person, right time, and then delivering real-time messages that are pertinent and offer them some value. Um, so I would say, you know, from MPP's perspective, um, certainly being able to be really flexible with offers, create voucher codes, you know, do discounts, where we really see this, the peaks in subscriber acquisition, certainly around experimentation um, with, with those tools. Um, so you really need, you know, a, a combination of technologies. You need the paywall, obviously, to display the offers, but then you also need the, the, the technology to be able to create them in the first place. Um, and we see particularly things like free trials with an auto renew that just kicks in. So you, you add your payment details up front, um, but then it just rolls into payment month to month. Um, <laughs> obviously, convert more so um, and have higher retention rates. I know we see in Europe and the newspaper sector, quite a lot of the publishers out there um they have a preference towards a two or a three year um subscription up front because they know the retention rates are really great there so i think there is there's no short answer james um it, but, but my, my the the crux of it is experimentation continual journey it's a marathon um not a sprint alan what about the pitfalls what are the things that we avoid in customer acquisition um well I mean, I, I kind of link it back to something uh, kind of in general about customer acquisition, which I'd say always lead with your content, because that is the thing that will keep um, people coming back. Um, and because I think sometimes when you're, if you're leading with an offer, for example, uh, you know, you have people getting a, a very cheap deal for, for a month or two, and then suddenly you jack them up by a, a ridiculous percentage and they go, hang on, why, why, why am I getting this, this huge bill all of a sudden? So while offers are really good, I think, uh, you know, we have to be very careful. Also, I think there was a, there was a time when uh, publishers often used to kind of think that free gifts and giveaways, you know, buy, get a free iPad with your subscription was a good idea. Uh, what we found, uh, you know, we made these mistakes many years ago now, um, was that people often, you know, you got a lot of very committed iPad uh, users then and not very committed subscribers to your publication. So that's what I think always lead with the content because that's, that is the thing that will keep people coming back, you know, day after day, week after week and what gives them the value ultimately in their subscription. So anything that distracts from that, I think uh, in, the, in the longer run is, is going to be difficult and going to cause you problems. Um, but yeah, when they're discount with care, I think as well, it's a good way to, to kind of encourage people to kind of step over the line um but don't get them locked into a eternal discount i yeah. think it is a really important point to make actually alan and i completely agree with you because technology will only take you so far if if the, the experience post paywall uh, isn't good 
um yeah. that, that that then you you ultimately you would never retain your subscribers and that's you know that that's an even bigger challenge isn't it post acquisition um but i think you're absolutely right and i think it's those engagements in content that are driven by you know rethinking what the value proposition is what those metrics are do we want volume um based metrics that look at you know clicks and unique traffic and you know the traditional metrics that we're seeing or do we need to move more to the, 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 the kind of quality-based metrics? You know, how regularly people come back to the site, how, how you know, the recency, frequency, volume type stuff that we see coming from the FT. So I completely agree, you know, we can put the, the mechanisms in place, but, mm. the, the, you know, the content has to be there and the focus on the user's experience um, is so important. Definitely. I think one of the biggest pitfalls is assuming or, or uh, that the subscription journey ends at the point of subscription. Um, it's a, called a recurring revenue model for a reason. And <laughs> you want to build that relationship over a period of time. And that's why when, we, when we're looking at something from a Zephyr perspective, we're not only looking at how we can improve the experience of the subscriber up until that point of, um, point of conversion, but through our partnerships with um, providers like MPP, it's actually then how do you start to look at that relationship beyond where if this subscriber is going to be with you for a year, two years, three years, four years, or ideally longer, you actually want to make sure that you're improving their experience and learning from them um, because not only are they do you want them to renew but actually if for some reason they were ever to cancel their subscription you've got to make sure that they're also backwards compatible like you've gathered all of this data that they've given you while they've been a loyal subscriber actually how do you now not only try and use the information to get them back to being a paid subscriber but actually how do you then use that data to increase them as a cpm driving ad revenue partner because despite them no longer subscribing it's very unlikely that they're going to completely stop visiting your content altogether because they saw value in it before so actually how do you continue that journey post subscription um while they're still a subscriber and post subscription if and when they uh, cancel their subscription uh, we have a, a question from the audience, which from uh, Michaelis. Thank you very much, Michaelis, for your question. I'm not sure I entirely understand it, so I wonder if you could just rephrase that for me and put it in the Q and A box again, and then I will ask it to our uh, to our experts in a moment. So while uh, while Michaelis is doing that, let me just uh, move on to uh, this question of the payment model, uh, because we've uh, got a number of people out there. We'll have a number of people who are members of our audience who are consumers of ours who aren't prepared to, to subscribe, but they might be prepared to pay occasionally. Now, we've been back and forth on this debate around micropayments for a very long time in the industry. There's been lots of attempts at doing it. Do you think the time is coming when that is going to be a widely adopted mainstream technology in news and, and magazine digital businesses? Mark, what's your feeling on that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, as we've kind of, one of the core tenants of uh, today's session is kind of, uh, been is, is diversity um, and we need to have an understanding of where all these options are going to lie and and micropayments right or rather than micropayments just a one-off payment or a one-off transaction for either a specific piece of content or a specific time period um, has to be something that publishers are not only considering but including in their arsenal i for, i for personally i'm a huge american politics fan um and while it feels like they're constantly in an election cycle there are specific times where i would quite happily subscribe to the new york times for a specific period of time and pay a one-off fee because i value their political content i don't need to subscribe to them all the time um so it's 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 I think we are starting to move towards that, especially with things like when you see uh, there, there are learnings to be taken from um, the broadcast media space where everything is packaged um, sky if you want to or even uh, if you if you're into sports, you have to pay an additional fee for your sports content. And I don't see why that can't be taken on um, by uh, digital publishing and, and publishing as a whole where. If, you, if you're providing very unique, specific value to a customer and they're willing to pay for that, but separate of everything else, that should be something that we embrace as a revenue stream. I know when we were preparing for this call, you, you spoke about examples from outside of publishing where this is happening now. Just, just tell us your perspective on micropayments and one-off payments. 
Yeah, sure, of course. So, um, so we at MPP we specialise in um, not just in publishing, uh, but but more broadly media and entertainment, which includes you know broadcasters, OTT services, um, and you know particularly through uh, the pandemic and, and and over the last few years, you know we've seen all those kind of traditional um, OTT models with on demand. Um, uh, access to films, etc. But we've also seen a huge growth in on-demand events. Um, so we've got some customers, including people like Live Now. Uh, we did a Dua Lipa concert, so you could pay to attend. We did Gorillas uh, last year as well, which were you know ticketed events. Which, when you think about it, plays quite well to the publishing space. You know those those kind of one-time events. Um, so I think, yeah, absolutely, there, there, there is some huge potential possibilities. Uh, micropayments, I've seen. Uh, so we've had um, clients like L'Equipe in France, who like a sports national newspaper, who um, absolutely experimented with micropayments as a, a means to try and drive people to take the full print and digital subscription. Um, they did that for a year or so. Um, and what they discovered were only 5% of those people converted to pay for a full subscription, but quite a high percentage of them came back and bought on demand on a regular basis. Um, they transitioned after experimenting to more of a day pass model, um, which I think is actually, it better fits what they're trying to do, which is to drive engagement, you know, rather than charge per article. We want people to engage with the content so they know how much they love it and they want to come back and buy another day pass. So I think that there are lots of different on-demand models. I think that, the, the, again, the thing that is stopping publishers is having that ability to have that e-wallet stored, you know, that Amazon style, iTunes style, you know, one-click transaction. So that's that's one of the things that we're doing with a lot of big media groups at the moment is implementing that alongside the ID, the first party data. Um, because again, you know, it's the journey. They might buy a subscription on day one, but what else can we sell over 12 months, two years, et cetera? And, you know, events upsell, if you can do it with a nice streamlined one-click transaction, then, you know, we've all done it, haven't we, on the app store, you know, before you've, before you've thought about it, it's a couple of quid, isn't it? But you get access to the content that you enjoy. So, yeah, I think there's this there's, there's huge potential and, and particularly for magazines where, you know, we might need to be a little bit more creative rather than, you know, potentially just gating content. Alan, just, I want to move on to, because we're running out of time, I just want to move on to customer service. Just, just give us your view on, first of all, how important a role customer service plays in the, in the kind of digital subscription journey. And secondly, how publishers can address that, given that many of them would have outsourced their customer service to their bureau or elsewhere over the, over over many years. So, uh, just give us your perspective. Yeah, I think I think the 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 relationship is, is something that you really want to kind of address in house as much as possible, um, because that's the place you get your best feedback from your customers. And um, I think it's key if you want to kind of uh, you know we we had great success in in a, a call center that was able to stop people churning. Um, by reminding them of the values they got from their, their their service. However, I recognize this is expensive, but I think over time, a lot more kind of automated um, customer service operations are or options are available, and I, I think they're certainly worth worth looking towards. And you know, to be honest, I don't I don't have a whole lot of experience with bureaus, but I, I'm sure this is something that is high on their their list of priorities at the moment. Um, uh, as well, because, you know, it is it is something we, you know, in many years gone by, we, ne we never really had to think about this kind of customer service being so direct, but it's it's very much in the kind of at the top of users' minds at the moment, because they are now used to getting um, exceptional customer service from, uh, or what they, they will see as exceptional customer service from the likes of Netflix and so on, where, you know, they can, they can, come on and come off of their their subscription as at uh, the point that's convenient to them rather than convenient to the um the kind of provider and you know as a industry the the news industry and the publishing industry needs to respond to this and be as kind of friction free as possible this may need a little bit of investment in in human bodies at the kind of at the publisher level but 
I think you know over time the the automation will will get a lot better and help us out in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Michaelis, thank you for your resubmitted question, which I, I understand is, a, is an excellent question. I will ask that uh, in a moment. Uh, but let me first of all just move on to the tech stack and the tech stack journey. Uh, Mark, how do you get started with your tech stack journey? It seems like if, if you're not in it already, it seems quite daunting. It seems like it's not easy. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good question. Um, there's traditionally been constantly the kind of build versus buy um, uh, debate across um, uh, any industry really and, and, and in publishing is no different medium publishing is no different um, I think it's really starting to get an understanding of what your ultimate goals are um, and understanding kind of what your tech stack is today many of the legacy partner um, customers that we have are not they're dipping they've kind of maybe had a uh, a paywall or a, or a data structure in place but they've owned all of their technology historically and actually they're starting to see as it wants to grow okay well how do we start to kind of swap out certain things and, and really the key thing here um that we really promote at zephyr is that you want to maintain control and you want to maintain uh, flexibility of choice um and really starting to look at your tech stack and and work with providers who want to work with each other and having that understanding is one of the reasons why we've partnered with people like MPP, who are a great partner of ours, so that we can actually start to deliver and um, greater value to our customers and say, well, actually, I know it can seem very daunting, but actually, what are your ultimate goals? What are your strategies that you're trying to, to build? And if you're starting to build, if you just want to build and increase your CPMs and kind of just uh, reaffirm your data structure at the moment well you're going to need something like a cdp and a crm and, and uh, potentially something like a zephyr for, for your front end experience but as you then start to move into payments and transactions etc you're going to need a subscription management provider like mpp you're going to, need to build so it, it should be this modular approach um and there are of course in any industry there are two ways of going down it there are there are all in one providers out there who will uh who will uh, say that you'll need everything and, and eventually you'll need everything so buy everything at once. But I think for a publisher or a company taking their first steps into it, it's, it's nailing down what you want for your strategy and then working with providers and asking those questions to see, okay, actually who works together? What can we do first? And, and building that implementation plan and, and growth strategy that maps both your revenue and the technologies that you'll need in your stack. Yeah, absolutely. Modular software as a service approach definitely seems to be the way to go. So uh, we're nearly at the end and I've got a few uh, questions to ask you from the audience. If there are more questions, audience, that you would like to ask, then please do submit them now because we'll come to that momentarily. But before we do that, I want to ask all three of you about metrics. How do we measure success, Anna, in this space? <laughs> um, back to what we were saying earlier, really. I think more fundamentally, how do we get the whole business to agree on what success looks like um, and stop battling each other would be my, um, my biggest comment. And, I, I, you know, I started to see this. I went to um, various different conferences back end of last year. Um, and, and again, this, this, this issue with the cookies is it, driving some real attention um, top down. So, I, you know, same in any company. We all need to agree on what the metrics are. Um, and then we all need to, as a united front, get behind them. Um, like I say, I, I really like um, some of the stuff that we're seeing from people like FT Strategies, recency, frequency, volume type metrics, engagement metrics. Um, I think we absolutely need to become more customer centric, um, which genuinely does mean putting yourself in the customer's shoes um, and understanding that actually, you know, too many pop ups can be uncomfortable, too much advertising, doesn't always work. Understanding that value proposition and then driving that top down through, through the business. Um, so, so yeah, definitely engagement metrics and, 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 and encouraging people to come back um, uh, and, and, and read more content. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's the big shift that I'm not sure everybody is quite ready to take yet. Um, but watch this space because I think we're getting there. Uh, Alan, anything to add on that? Yeah, I, th I think that's, uh, Anna makes really good points there. And I think the, I think people are at different stages of this. And I, no I noticed in the kind of the, the kind of the former newspaper business, um, that initially when people put in a, a paid model and I'm talking about subscriptions here, their focus tends to be on acquisition um, because you, you need to get people through the door. And so that's your obsession should be at a certain point, 
However, you need to start switching that to be really focused on retention because uh, you know it is a lot cheaper to keep customers and acquire them over and over again. So the aim should be to keep the people you've got and to really serve them well. And then all the the uh, the frequency, recency, et cetera, med- metrics that Anna mentioned, they really come into their own at that point. So I think it depends where you're at in your, your journey. I, I definitely think if you're becoming a more uh, mature subscription business, then churn is your enemy. Um, you know, and that, that's the lesson from all the TV uh, companies that uh, kind of were in the subscription business long before we were. Uh, the, the more you reduce churn, your obsession with churn is what will kind of see you right in the long term. But in the early stages, you, you have to get, get your customers in. Um, and so obsess about acquisition at that point. Mark? Yeah, I, I totally agree with what everyone has said. Um, the only other thing I would add is uh, just to build on uh, Anna's point around getting the whole business to agree. I think, especially when we're dealing in a digital space, the targets and the goals and the metrics that your technology arm of your business are going to be looking at will be very different to what your uh, commercial arm of your business is, is and actually understanding how you get alignment between those two sides of the business will ultimately help you understand the the metrics and and how you measure success across the board technology is really going to care about especially as you add new tech uh, technology to your tech stack how anything that you add or any strategy you do affect dwell time affect page load speed uh, the load of the page etc um, those should be just as um, uh, important metrics as kind of dwell your classical um, dwell times click through rates etc cetera, etc cetera. so finding agreement across the business not saying that certain uh, metrics are more important than others but actually finding out what what care how everything sorry the individual metrics that everyone cares about even if they're different and then and balancing the two between those um so that you can actually ultimately not find harmony across the business Fantastic. We all want harmony across our businesses. Um, we've got a couple of great questions here from the audience. I'm going to take uh, Michaelis's question first. Uh, maybe, Alan, you can start with this one. Uh, your panel says that we should understand what our readers want and as news providers adjust accordingly. Uh, maybe I misunderstood, but isn't that like readers dictating your policy on content? <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, fab. Well, this is the ongoing debate, isn't it? If you, um, so I have, I have been in newsrooms where people have talk, talked about recommending content, for example. So personalising the content that you see based on what you're reading. Now, me personally, I, I wouldn't like that. If I was reading the news, I think I want a nice balanced view. Um, so I wouldn't focus on, on, on that type of personalisation. What I would focus on more so is data about how regularly someone is engaging, how much of your content they're reading, the, you know, the types of formats of content that you produce, maybe long form performs better than short form. Maybe it's video that converts more readers. So I think there's lots of different ways uh, looking at, at, at personalizing user experiences, not necessarily um, the content. Um, that said, if you're a hobby magazine, or um, you're, you're producing a different format, um, not news content, absolutely. You know, you could use that, particularly if you're a media group who has, you know, 50 different publications, you could absolutely create a sports package, a lifestyle package across all of your brands. And, you know, that, that could be a product um, that you could take to market. So I don't know, <laughs> hopefully that answers the question. Alan, I wanted to, I wanted to just reframe that very slightly for you because you've been in the newsrooms at the Times and the Sun. Yeah. It was was there was there a debate between instinct versus data? You know, in, in oh, the... yes, absolutely. And I, I think in answer to Michaelis's question, I don't think readers will ever dictate uh, to a kind of large degree what newsrooms write. So I think it's the difference between data led and data informed. And I think actually newsrooms have been far too little data informed. Um, in fact, almost not at all to a large degree until very recently. And I think the, the fear that if you see the data um, says you should write lots of articles about um, the royal family, that that's all you're going to do is totally misplaced. Because as I used to say to the editor, um, that's why you have an editor. You know, the data is there to inform you, not to tell you what to do. And every journalist I've met um, kind of is, you know, headstrong in asking questions, in looking for new stories, 
uh, and so on and so forth. And I, I, I cannot see a newsroom being entirely dictated by data, not now and not ever, unless it makes the choice to be so. And then it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Um, because, you know, you look at the biggest companies in the world, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Netflix, well, not, Netflix, not one of the biggest, but, you know, successful. They're all data companies, essentially. So why have we been so resistant to data is the, the question I would ask back. That's the irony, isn't it? They're all data companies trying to add a creative element, and we're all creative businesses yeah. trying to add a data element. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. your most valuable asset, isn't it? Arguably, in the digital world, beyond your brand and the content that you produce, your next biggest asset is your data. Yeah, <laughs> well, arguably, sort of, the data about your consumers. I mean, it should give us some confidence in how hard it is to do our bit of the business well. You look at a business like Apple, which you think would be able to smash this out of the park, the creative side of the Apple business is really hard for them um, because they're fundamentally a data and products business. Anyway, Mark, I want to move to you for this other question um, from Brandon Vesely. Vesely, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. Thank you very much for this. You talked a lot about gathering first party user data. This is, by the way, Brandon, this is a question I do hear a lot from publishers. It's definitely something that we're looking to do, but what does one do once you've actually got it? How do you actually use it? Can you dump it into Google Analytics Manager or something? So what do you, what do, you do with the data? How do you collect it? Where do you put it? That's a very good question. So uh, it's actually perfectly like it's one of the key tenets of what we try and do at Zephyr is actually how do you make that data that you've collected actionable and then build additional strategies off the back of it. It's all well and good that you have and you've collected all this first party data. But if you want to, for example, if you want to use that data that you've collected to drive up ad, um, your ad CPMs, then you're going to have to put it into a DMP and, and integrate with some of the exchanges. If you're using it to drive additional um, subscription once you want to start to build out that data um the data capture in your reg wall side of the business and then use that data that comes in so for example we uh, if you're using zephyr for example as an identity store and you're able to build that out you can build individual subscription journeys so if you know someone has visited your sports content uh uh most regularly you can actually serve them a sports related paywall regardless of where they are on the on the site so you can really start to help promote that um promote that value that you're showing so it's actually really starting to find it's why we call ourselves a subscription experience platform because you need to find ways to action that data and and there are providers out there like zephyr that will really help you to do that similarly there are partners out there like uh mather and and, and permitive um uh who have uh uh um, propensity modeling um, that you can put your data into and actually start to kind of get a little bit more uh, 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 nuanced and specific with what you're trying to do in terms of conversion. But um, really, it's 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 once you've got that data, it's what you want to do with it. And once you decide what you want to do with it, there are technology partners out there for you to work with who will really help you um, and take that data to the next level to help you achieve your goals. Yeah, and I will give a small plug to Zephyr as we finish. We use Zephyr at Fit. We are a very small organization and not technically minded at all, and we managed to implement it ourselves. I built the user journey myself. It's, that's how easy it is. If even an idiot like me can do it, then you certainly <laughs> can do it in your businesses. Uh, anywhere. That's the key, isn't it, James? It's all about UX and ease of use and actually just putting the power back in the hands of the marketing and the product teams so that they can experiment you know, and, and, and do that on the fly without yeah. having to ring up tech and, you know, bug them again. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. Fantastic. Well, listen, we're out of time, everybody. Thank you very much, Mark, Alan, Anna. Thank you for your time this afternoon for joining us and talking about this important subject. Thank you to all of you for watching today as well. If you like what you saw today and you want to learn more, please go to fip.com, F-I-P-P.com to learn more about who we are and what we do. And if you want an in-person live experience for the first time in who knows how many years, then please do come and see us at the FIP Congress, which will be in Lisbon in Portugal, June the 7th to the 9th. We look forward to seeing you there. In the meantime, though, it only remains for me to say thank you very much to our guests. Thank you to Mark, to Alan, to Anna. Thank you to all of you. We'll see you again soon and goodbye.